I told the, the people in the back that I needed a prop. I needed a rocket, and so the water bottle is my rocket for today, and it will sit there until I need it. Good morning. Uh, I'm extremely pleased to be here. This is uh, an extraordinary event, uh, first of its kind, and at the dinner last night, I got to meet people that are doing things much more difficult than what I'm doing, and so uh, with that, I'm, I'm going to share with you some of my experience, some of the challenges that we have for the future. Uh, we'll talk about how we are going to, to continue the, to evolve the art of space transportation, because it's not pure science, because you have to have a sense of what you're going to do. So I think artists often have that sense. And so I'll, I'll share with you um, and one of the fundamental things that, that helps us go. First of all, uh, I think it's good to know the history of how we got here. And the history of rockets goes back to the invention of gunpowder in about eight, 850. And then the first use of gunpowder in a rocket system in 1232, where the Chinese repulsed the Mongols. And they called them uh, arrows of flying fire. And that was uh, during the Battle of Kaifeng Fu. And <clears throat> because, you know, I like this chief engineer role, I wanted to see what the chief engineer's design looked like. And this is the engineering drawing that I found. And you see that it's got a fuse and a long stick. That's for stability and control. That's, that's the version back then. And uh, I think he's wearing protective gear, just in case something goes awry. But this gives you an idea of, of where we started. You know, we really didn't know how things worked back then. We just tried them out. Now, 500 years later, 561 years later, you can see there's been an improvement made. We've now taken a bayonet or a sword and affixed it to the front, as if a, an exploding rocket falling upon you was not sufficient to kill you. We're now going to use, you know, a long saber. And this is in 1793. Not a lot has changed. Not a lot has changed. Let's fast forward. We finally started over time to understand the formulas that controlled the motion of an object through space or air. And it was first developed by a British mathematician. Uh, and we called it the Tilskovsky formula because in 1903, Konstantin Tilskovsky is the one that actually published the formula. So it had been around for a little bit longer than he, and uh, it finally got published. And we'll talk about the details of this, but this kind of controls my life. You know, guys do a nuclear fusion. Your math is way too difficult for me. This is as much as I can handle. And again, in 1912, it was, you know, reimagined. And then in 1920, it was, it was proven again. And you can see there's something here. British, Russian, US, German. Not a lot of collaboration internationally as we, as we seek to find formulas for, for things that we all should know, you know, motion. So Tilskovsky got his name on it because he's the first guy to publish it. Now, Goddard also rediscovered the formula, but he added liquid propellants. Before, we were taking powders, we were mixing them, making them ignite, and things would fly. He said, perhaps I can use liquid propellants. Now, <clears throat> There's some peculiarities about his rocket. He used gasoline and liquid oxygen, and the rocket is up there, the propellants are down here, so basically the rocket engine fires on his propellant tanks. But improvements were made over time with that. So let's go into what's the difference between the Tilskovsky formula and the rocket equation. Exit velocity, how fast can we make particles fly out the back? This is the extreme example of F equals MA. If you throw something hard enough in one direction, it'll force you to go the other direction. We matured it as we started to apply it to things that flew across the Earth or uh, above the Earth and started adding term-like specific energy, taking into account gravity, the loss that gravity causes, and the loss that drag causes. So now we're starting to take in other world effects. The big thing that stayed the same is the mass of your initial system versus the mass of your final system, that, that uh, mass fraction we often call it. That part is really, really hard. And when we started, we could barely get anything to orbit. So as we look at this, to get to orbit, you have to go about 17,000 miles per hour. 
you have to have very efficient propulsion, and efficiency is measured in seconds. How long can one pound of propellant provide one pound of thrust? You have to fight the force of gravity, and then you have the initial mass, final mass, losses due to gravity, and losses due to drag. And one other thing that's not mentioned in any of those is you need to be above most of the atmosphere. So if you're above about 300,000 feet, you're okay. If you're below that, the atmosphere starts to, to drag on you and you don't stay in orbit. So just getting fast isn't good enough. You have to go fast in a specific direction at a specific altitude. Now, in the beginning, you know, we would find that we didn't have enough, you know, rocket to get to orbit. We, we could go fast, but we wouldn't go fast enough to actually get to orbit, so we'd fall back. Then we figured out, you know, we can repeat this formula and do it twice if we stage, or even three times if we stage. And we get to start the formula over. And the part that you threw away, the mass final, is not part of the mass initial up here. So you now get a boost by having dropped off all the dead mass, and that helps you get to orbit. So now history presses on. In uh, 1944, the V2 was the first rocket to, to actually cross the von Karman line and make it into space. Uh, it used a, uh, uh, a liquid oxygen uh, ethylene solution, I think, for the, for the propellants. Uh, but it was like that first arc. It came back down somewhere else, which is what it was intended to do. First time we actually made it to orbit was in October uh, 1957. And this took up Sputnik. By the way, who here is born before October 1957? Who here was born before then? Oh, this is really sad. <laughs> I was born before then. I was born in 1956. So all of you people were born, and there were satellites in orbit already. Somebody had flown to orbit. When I was born, people had gone up and come down, or stuff had gone up and come down, but nothing had made it to space in orbit. So all of you are space children. You know, you, you've never known a world where there weren't satellites flying above you. I am really the oldest person here? Nobody? <laughs> Nobody on the crew? Anybody? Gee, money. Okay. Uh, oh, man, that's discouraging. Okay, uh, the, the Soviets then launched dogs, and I'm an old dog. Uh, now, I put this in here because there's a change. Not only do we need to go fast and we, we want to, you know, go to orbit, we said, well, you know, there's that aerodynamic effect, drag. Can we have aerodynamics help us in the process? Well, the Air Force started a program, uh, the X-15 program, to see what can we do with rocket planes at very high speed. And so we started flying things through the atmosphere at very high speeds and learned a lot about it. And that actually fed into what we did in the shuttle program. We learned that we, if we get this vehicle going too fast, it gets very hot, the wings warp, you have to protect them, it'll burn up. So we started doing different things and learning a lot. We flew 199 of these missions. We tried to fly 200, but something always happened and it canceled. The program manager said, we're done. God is trying to tell us we shall not cross 200. We shall save our own lives in the program and call it quits. So that program was very instrumental because we did not know a lot. And we learned about high-speed aerodynamics, hypersonic aerodynamics. Uh, finally, we started launching people to orbit in 1961. Okay, anybody here born uh, before 1961, before that date? Oh my God. Okay, I, 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 by the way, I thought someone somewhere would be older than me. I should be on the side here with the, with the rest of the equipment at the relics, you know. <laughs> and this, ladies and gentlemen, from 1956 is how we used to do this. Here's just a collection of rockets in the United States that have carried people. So this one was a suborbital system. First part of the rocket equation, right? It goes, not enough to get to orbit, comes back down. Uh, Alan Shepard took about a 15 minute ride in that. Uh, liquid oxygen and, uh, and alcohol, or ethanol. I can't remember which was that one. Second, this was, a, by the way, this was an intermediate range ballistic missile. A lot of the original rockets had you know, nefarious intent. They were gonna blow somebody up. Um, and we started putting people on top of them, which made them very, very comfortable. This is an atlas. 
the Atlas, kind of like the other rockets, is that we dropped something. What we dropped on the Atlas are the two outer engines. This has three engines, liquid oxygen and kerosene. We drop the two engines, so we drop a chunk of the rocket, but we leave the rest of the rocket together to go forward. Now, you notice how shiny it is. Stainless steel. Stainless steel that is thinner than a dime in many cases. So if you take a coin out of your pocket and, and look at the thickness of that coin, nobody carries coins anymore, so I have to find a new analogy. Uh, if, you, if you look at a coin, the thickness of that coin is often thicker than the skin on this rocket. So the idea here was to make the mass final, the, the, that the, how much you have to actually take all the way up there, as small as possible by making the rocket as skinny as possible in terms of the thickness of the tank that's holding the propellant. And the only way you could make this that thin is to keep it under pressure. So if you have a soda can and you haven't opened it, you can stand on it, you know, and the can will not collapse. Open the can, stand on it, it'll collapse. Same applies here. So we learned how to ride, ride a pressure stabilized system. And we found a few volunteers to fly on top. Now, this one goes back to my experience. This is a uh, Titan II, Gemini Titan II. I was a Titan II launch officer in the Air Force about 100 years ago. And we used nitrogen tetroxide for our, for our oxidizer and unsymmetrical dimethyl hydrazine and hydrazine in a 50-50 blend as our fuel. Now, does this sound like fun? These are toxic, toxic, toxic chemicals. You know, you know I, I had black hair until I started working with this. I started working these propellants, went white immediately. But they're carcinogenic. They, if, if, you, if you spill it on your skin, it'll burn you. Uh, but they're very, very high energy. So we sought that energy and we could store them for a long time. And uh, it often leads with a, an orangish cloud because we have an oxidizer lead. But that's how we, we kind of got started. So we tried different propellant mixtures. And then finally, the smallest rocket over there, which is actually the largest, is the Saturn V. Liquid oxygen and kerosene on the base, liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen on the upper stage, uh, both upper stages. And so that was a big challenge. Now you notice that this, is a, this rocket was like 365 feet tall. And it had so much extra mass when it finished staging that you could take the capsule on top, the lunar lander, and throw it into lunar orbit. So we were starting to get really, really good at the efficiency of launching things by improving the mass fraction and improving our propulsive skills. So that was, uh, that was an important feature. Now we get into the modern age. This was the vehicle I was supposed to fly. So the, uh, the difference is this is part of the mass final, the this, this, this space plane the craft that comes back. So you have to be efficient enough with everything else to get all of that to orbit. So it meant that our efficiency was going up significantly uh, by the time the shuttle arrived. 450 seconds of ISP on the three main engines. We cheated a little bit and took the external tank, and that's where we put the propellants, outside the bird. And then we, once we got to orbit, we detached the tank. We used the solids, you know, all the way back from, you know, China to, to actually provide the boost to get us up there to fight the initial gravity losses. So we use the technology that goes all the way back to, to China, uh, technology that goes back to uh, the, the Apollo program, the liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen. So we, we tried to combine everything we knew to make a vehicle that was more and more reusable. But it wasn't the, the first vehicle to ever land intact. The first one was the old Delta X, uh, DCX, and it was LOX hydrogen engines, four of them, and it went, it hovered, it landed, flew 12 times. So when you see this picture, it's not a surprise because it's not that that in technology was invented just at this time, it had been around. It was just a reapplication of the technology to try and make the system more reusable. So now that we've got that mass fraction thing figured out, we need to figure out how do we get the cost down? And if we can reuse as much of the rocket as we can, we can start to make it more cost efficient. And so the extreme version of that is all three of these uh, booster engines or booster vehicles come back and they land, either on land or on a barge, but we can now reuse it. So it's the ultimate staging because we throw the stages away that we don't need. 
We keep extra propellant in them and bring it back. So it was kind of an interesting uh, application. Now, what you're seeing on the future horizon are things like this. This is the electron vehicle, and that's carbon composite. So we've gone from stainless steel to aluminum to carbon composite. Again, trying to work on that mass final part, trying to get the mass of the system down as far as possible. And if you scale that up and use high energy engines, you can put an entire rocket into space and then reuse, uh, reuse the entire booster section and put the only section that you want to go to orbit into orbit. So you're starting to see the transition building upon the technologies of the past uh, for the technologies of the future. And by the way, the propellant that's being used here is LOX methane. Methane is not quite as energetic as hydrogen, but it stores better, lower temperatures, so it ends up being kind of a good balancing point. Here, I put this in here because we say, well, can't we just fly to orbit? And do these equations, do they, do, they, um, do they guide airplanes? I mean, will an airplane fly with the same equation? The answer is yes. The difference is the airplane is getting its oxidizer from the air. It only has to carry its fuel. So it gets a big benefit from not having to carry its own liquid oxygen, which is the heavy component of the propellant. This one, the Sabre engine, breathes in the air. It has hydrogen in a big tank here that forms the body of the system. That liquid hydrogen cools the air. You can pull out of the air the oxygen and then burn it because the, you know, the partial pressure of oxygen flying at those speeds isn't sufficient to sustain combustion. So you have to liquefy it, then burn it. Big thermodynamic challenge, but you know, the theory is it would work quite well if you could make that air breathing system work. But there are other ways to, to get to orbit and back, and you can use a traditional rocket, LOX kerosene, put a space plane on top, and fly it home. Notice these guys are wearing spacesuits. This is an unmanned vehicle. None of them went to space. They're wearing spacesuits because they're playing with the same propellants that I played with. Nitrogen tetroxide, or uh, nitrous oxide, and um, an unsymmetrical dimethyl hydrazine, or monomethyl hydrazine. So to protect themselves from their own vehicle when it comes home, they have to have a spacesuit and, and, and not breathe any air left over from the vehicle. So this is a kind of interesting hybrid. So you fly to orbit using a regular rocket, you come home. The uh, uh, Dream Chaser doing the same thing, and it's now gonna fly on the Vulcan rocket, LOX methane rocket, uh, with a uh, cryogenic upper stage, LOX hydrogen upper stage, but they only have to worry about bringing the craft home. So the reusability is all tied up in the vehicle that comes home, kind of like the shuttle. You know, get a ride, but I'll bring that part back. I'll build everything new. The challenge is, can you do it with bringing everything back? That's hard. But, um, but this is SpaceX, uh, you know, Starlifter, or um, Star, Starship. You notice he went back to stainless steel. Remember the Atlas? It's not pressure stabilized, but it's a very effective material. So you can store a lot of propellant in it and it's got good temperature characteristics for both uh, ascent and re-entry. Re and so that would be a vertical takeoff, vertical landing. You bring everything home. Notice the size is getting bigger. In order to make that mass fraction equation work, the bigger the vehicle, the easier that mass fraction is. This is what was supposed to launch um, a few days ago. Didn't make it off the pad. Uh, it's got a big hydrogen tank. The hydrogen tank, by the way, is the same size tank from a diameter standpoint as the, uh, the tank on the shuttle. So we reuse that. The solids are essentially the same type of solids we used on the shuttle. We added a segment to it. So we use both solids, high energy uh, propellants, and we use four shuttle engines down at the bottom. And we throw it all away, except for the part at the top where the people are. So, kind of a little bit of a regression on the reuse, but in the NASA experience, they really wanted to make it efficient to go to, uh, to the moon and Mars. And so that was what they were striving for there. So let's look at the equation, and let's look at the, the future equation. You still gotta reach 17,000 miles an hour to get to orbit. 
You still have to have very efficient propulsion. We've made a lot of progress there. Still have to fight gravity. That we haven't changed. The mass initial, you know, we're starting to use denser propellants. Um, we're starting to use uh, uh, lighter weight materials, and that also uh, makes our mass final smaller, so we're just becoming more mass efficient over time. Uh, the gravity losses, in some cases, when you fly, I'll use my prop, when you fly vertically, the time that you're going up is thrust that's kind of wasted because you're just fighting gravity. You haven't done anything to give yourself velocity in this direction. So the component of your flight that is fighting gravity is a loss. That's where that comes in, the gravity loss. So if you're able to fly horizontally more, you'd, you'd uh, reduce the gravity loss significantly, but we still take off vertically. You know, it's, it's, it's how we do things. And the drag losses are affected, that's why we have right circular cylinders, because the drag is, is smallest for a cylindrical object. But the drag losses now uh, can be diminished. But we still have to find a way to make more aerodynamic shapes to make that uh, more efficient. So here's some of the features that you'll see. Increased reusability. We've gotten really good at making the rocket equation close. So we can start adding more mass final and bring it back home to reuse it. Lighter weight tanks and, and structures. You're seeing us transition from aluminum, stainless steel, really thin where we can, and composites. The composites are really gonna make probably the big difference for us. Higher density, non-toxic propellants. So not just can we get propellant in the tank, but can we get more propellant in the tank? So we cool the propellant, make it more dense, and shove as many molecules of whatever propellant we're using in the tanks. You're gonna see more and more subcooled cryogen. There's limits. More efficient engines, higher chamber pressures. We're gonna be flying near stoichiometric. So at that, we're, we're as efficient as we can with a, a propellant fuel molecule and a propellant oxidizer molecule, and we'll burn them with no waste. The problem is that creates extraordinary heat. So we tend to melt our own engines when we're stoichiometric, but we're trying to get as close as we can, and hopefully we can do both material science, flow, uh, flow cooling science, et cetera, to help us uh, keep that pressure and keep that, uh, that chemical efficiency. Uh, reusability and improve operability. This is gonna be the big game changer. Right now we're flying vehicles back to launch sites with the landing pads and barges, but you're gonna see minimal maintenance between flights. Right now there's a lot of work. You know, you have to refurbish everything to make sure it's really ready. You don't do that much work between airplane flights. So the question is how close can we get to that, to that airplane flight? Well, if you're pushing the engine really hard, it's really hard to make it reusable just, you know, just turning it over, but we're absolutely learning. Increased launch vehicle and launch site diversity. Everything that launches from the US launches from the coast. It's gonna go from Vandenberg on the west coast, uh, Wallops or the Cape on the east coast, but it's because we have the concern that we have to drop our parts in the, in the water. If, uh, if you overfly land, those parts drop on land, uh, and, and the people on the land tend to not like that. But since we don't have a sufficient confidence in our ability to control those systems quite yet, uh, we still fly over the oceans. Over time, you'll see that start to change. We'll fly over unpopulated or sparsely populated areas. And that happens as our confidence grows with our ability to target where the vehicle pieces or the vehicle itself will come down. You're gonna see bigger vehicles, Starship, because bigger payloads, better propellant mass fraction, you know, so we can, we can make the vehicle much, much more propellant uh, versus vehicle if we, uh, if we make the vehicle bigger. Uh, cube square law. Final vehicles, or excuse me, smaller vehicles, smaller payloads, less expensive to build and operate. So the spectrum is gonna be widened. You'll see diversity in the types of missions. We're gonna take big, big, big payloads to orbit and, and to the moon and Mars, and we're gonna take very, very small payloads to orbit. Little, little satellites that do very specific things, but will populate uh, the skies with lots of them. So you're gonna see the spread of the type of things we put in orbit uh, start to expand even further. And finally, you're gonna see more different types of launch vehicles flying people. There's very, very few vehicles that fly people right now. 
You were, we're okay with cargo, but you're gonna see more flying people. And those are the, the big shifts in the future that I see. The challenge is they don't come overnight. They don't just happen. They happen incrementally as we learn and understand our experience and push forward. So I'll show you this little video of what we're up to, and this will share some of the things that we do. We take off horizontally. We have an external tank. The external tank is, uh, is in the rocket sled. We have a booster, a first aid, which is the sled. It doesn't leave the ground. So we have velocity by the time we take off. And we're using high efficiency engines. We're flying horizontally most of the time so that that part of the gravity loss is diminished significantly. But our, but our drag losses go up. So we have to manage that flight profile very, very accurately. We can stay up for a few days. We can go around the world just once. We have a cockpit that can hold five people. And our, our highest missions will be able to go to the space station or space station orbit, which is about 51.6 inclination and about 230, 240 miles. We'll have a way to transfer people back and forth using a docking system that's already proven. This will be a challenge because, you know, it's a, it's a big craft and it'll have to mate with another big craft. But the ISS will not be the only space station flying. You know, Blue Origin has Orville Reef. Um, uh, we also have uh, Axiom with Axiom Sedation, which will initially be attached to the International Space Station, but eventually fly on its own. And others are planning space stations in different orbits. So space stations means people, and people means more different types of rockets. So this vehicle, kind of like the shuttle, it re-enters the atmosphere and flies home. The aerodynamics of the vehicle are such that it's a lot lighter when it comes home, so the ballistic coefficient is, is, uh, is very different. So we have greater cross range, should have a little less heat load on the, on the uh, tiles uh, for the re-entry. Should, I'm not sure that our analysis is bearing that out. But uh, yeah, it's always, the analysis is, it always gets you. And we land on a runway. Uh, we could land as short as I think is about 6,000 feet, but our balance field length is about uh, 10,000 feet. So that means if you have to fly out of that runway um, without a launch rail, then you can do so on a 10,000 foot runway. So that just gives you an idea of some of the things that, that we're looking at. And again, we used all the same elements that you've seen in all the rockets of the past. Uh, you see that we have a, a first stage. It just doesn't leave the ground. So all the mass associated with it is not penalized by the second stage. It's got an external tank, kind of like the shuttle, but it doesn't have to leave the ground. So the propellants fed in here allow this stage to take off completely full with velocity in a horizontal direction. So we're trying to learn as much, oh, by the way, it's an all composite bird. So we're trying to learn as much as we can from things of the past to guide our way to the future. And that's just our vision. So we've done some work and there's a new rocket equation in town and I want you guys to look at it. I want you to inspect it and see if you can spot the difference. I'll illuminate it. Do you see it now? Do you see it now? Guess what? It's the same equation. The, the, the rockets are gonna change but the physics won't. It's the fundamental equation that's gonna guide us. In, in what we do in trying to get things from Earth to orbit. So that part's gonna stay the same. So our objective is to try to create space flight with the ease of air flight. It's very difficult to implement the, the, the physics to make that happen, the mechanics to make that happen. We understand the math behind it, but it doesn't make it any less difficult. We have to build upon all the lessons that we've heard or we've seen in the past, good lessons, bad lessons, and try and incorporate those into our new vehicle as we go forward. But there's gonna be as much diversity in launch vehicles as our economies will allow. Investors, uh, companies and countries investing in this work, that's gonna to prove to you know, how wide is this population of new vehicles gonna be. So with that, I'll take any questions uh, from the audience, if there are any, you young whippersnappers all. In your short history of rocketry, it seemed like uh, failure was something that was essential for the learning and progress of stuff to the next stage. 
and it seems like now in this modern age, we we start to um, we started to embrace failure within rocketry and engineering. Is this something that you recognize? And if so, how important it, is it? it? It's important because if you insist that nothing you do will fail, either a developmental test um, um, or an actual flight, then you're, you're bound by the intelligence and your prescience of your analysis. It means that you really must know everything, or at least close enough to everything to push the button to assure that you don't have failure. And the way you avoid that failure is you step away from the edge. You say, if I go there, my margins are too thin, I'm gonna give myself more margin. I'm gonna make the vehicle heavier. I'll carry fewer people, I'll carry less cargo. So you, you step away from the edge of what you think is possible. But as you get closer to that edge, the likelihood of failure increases. And then it becomes the tolerance of your organization, uh, the funding of your organization to, to bear that failure. Uh, Discover 13 was the first um, satellite that made it to orbit that was part of the um, orbital reconnaissance program uh, that eventually became the, the Gambit program. Uh, I was a part of that, uh, that latter program. And we just declassified it a few years ago. And, um, and yes, we used to take cameras with film rolls and we'd take pictures, roll the film, take pictures, roll the film, and then bring the pictures home. And we'd drop the capsules into the atmosphere, we'd fly over it with an airplane, capture it in the air, reel it back into the back of the cargo plane, take the film canister, instead of to your, your CVS or wherever you get your film developed, we would take it to a special place in the United States on a classified facility and then develop the pictures. And we learned how to get really, really, really good pictures of cloud tops uh, because we didn't have the weather capabilities. The reason I mentioned Discover 13 is because we failed 12 times before then. We either blew the rocket up on the pad, the upper stage didn't fire, we went into an orbit, not quite, like something landed in the, you know, in the, in the Arctic, um, or we'd get up there and nothing worked and we'd re-enter. We do not have the tolerance for that today. You know, I could see Kairos going, you've, uh, you've blown up 10 of these rockets so far, and you would like us to fund another five or six? You know, what am I missing about this? And the, the answer is, you're missing that this is really hard, and that we don't know everything, and that each one of these tests helps us learn more. And that's why when you see SpaceX blowing up rockets, they don't worry it too much, because every time it happens, they learn something new. So we have to have risk tolerance, but it's gotta be a balance. We're gonna put people on our system, so that risk tolerance part is tough, you know, because you don't wanna do something that you could have avoided to save a human life. But we also have backup systems in case things go terribly wrong. I'm sorry, I, asked, I went for a really long time on that one question. Uh, I guess this is a bit of a follow-up. Um, so you showed us a system that is massive and incredible. What is the first iteration of this? How close is the demonstration to this? You just explained how you know, different organizations go through testing and experimenting and you know, blowing stuff up. <laughs> I'm guessing that there's gonna be a moment where Something needs to be blown up and, and yeah, I, what does it I don't, look like? I don't think I can actually talk about what you're gonna see next. I will tell you this, that the engines that you saw on that, uh, that bird, we've uh, we built a full scale 200,000 pound thrust class engine and we fired it a few times uh, in the middle of a forest. Um, I know the fire marshal quite well now. Um, but I'm not sure that's even gonna be the engine we use. We're, we're trying to figure out where's the balance, and it's the, the very next step is not public, and um, I, I, I'm not sure I can really answer your question without uh, divulging too much, but there are steps. There'll be structural things we're gonna do. We're building tanks, and we're gonna, we're gonna cycle those tanks. We're gonna pressurize them, put fragments in them, uh, detank them, uh, probably destroy them, and then cut them up and see how they work because we're doing things with composite materials that haven't been done before. So 
I'm, I'm, afraid, I'm sorry, I'm not able to answer that one too terribly well. Is it going to be? Arrow spikes? Nope. Nope. Okay. Nope. But we do have an altitude compensating engine. Okay. okay. I, th I, th I think I'm getting pretty close to the hook here. But, uh, you know, I've been fortunate enough to fly on different vehicles. I've jumped out of airplanes. I've jumped out of jets. I've flown supersonic. I've been a few seconds from crashing into the desert floor until we managed to get the airplane right again. So there's a lot of risk taking that goes on every day that you don't see. Uh, and, you know, fortunately, I've survived all that crap. Uh, so I, I'm still here to talk to you. But uh, it informs the work we do. It informs my value proposition for the people that fly on our craft. Um, why each one of those humans is so important and to not take that lightly. So it does, that does inform our work. Uh, thanks for the talk. Very, very enthusiastic, very interesting. Uh, I was wondering about your uh, launch pad. Um, is it something that has been tried in the past? Uh, why is it working uh, for you? Why, why hasn't it been used uh, uh, in the past? And second question is, um, your uh, vehicle is very versatile. How are you going to be cost competitive with other options uh, to take uh, you know, tourists to space or to fuel the International Space Station? Let me, let me take the first question first. Has it been tried before? It's been imagined before, but it's never really been tried. And so um, uh, years ago, NASA had a program, the X-33 program. It was supposed to be a single stage to orbit program. I was a program manager for Boeing. So I ran the, the Boeing team on that project. Uh, I, I recognized that the cost effectiveness was not going to be, it was not going to meet our target, and that um, we were going to have a much higher price tag than what was being expected. So I recommended we pull the plug on that program. And so I have a good feel from a technical standpoint of what it takes to get a single stage to orbit vehicle work. That was almost 30 years ago. So it's a long time ago. Um, but we're smarter now. We've got better materials. We're smarter on propulsion than we were before. So it's the slow creep of these parts of that equation that have made enough progress to get us over the mathematical part of the problem. Uh, the financing is gonna be a challenge, but once you fly a vehicle and bring it back, it's kind of like flying a medium-sized airliner. And the biggest expense becomes propellant. So that's why you end up with a, with a business plan that will actually close is because you're mostly expending propellant. And you don't have to change the engines out with every flight. Um, you should be able to fill it up and go again. But part of my experience from Boeing on, you know, how do we get an airplane to fly over and over and over again feeds into that part of the equation as well. So how do we get a space plane to fly over and over and over again? So that goes into our thinking from the very, very start. So it's, 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 it's hard, it's really difficult. It's really difficult, but we have a plan. Okay, I, I, I'm, I think I'm seeing a virtual hook. Uh-oh. Hey, thanks very much, Livingston. Um, you've been telling a bit about how you learned from the history, from how things are built from a physical point of view, right? What are the things that you've looked back on, on how people build things from a process and tooling perspective? What lesson learned have you taken so that your team also takes on the lessons learned from what you've seen yeah. in the past. When you didn't see a lot of individual people in the presentation, you saw a couple, because Tilskovsky figured out the formula. Uh, Goddard started using liquids. But what happened is the teams got very, very big. There was not enough intelligence in any one individual to actually make many of the systems work. Systems engineering was born out of that because you had so many different things going on in so many different places, you had to have a way to connect it together. The processes for system engineering were terribly difficult. You know, we had a, the, the V chart where you say, okay, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna design, build, and test something. Well, how do I verify that what I'm designing is gonna work? Is it gonna be analytical? Is it gonna be an actual test? And so we'd have to have a way to say, this is my requirement. This is how I validate the requirement. And we did it all in paper. Eventually, we started doing it in computers. 
but the computers were just really paper stacked electronically. It was really, really hard, and, and we didn't keep track of things extraordinarily well. So a design cycle of the space shuttle took about one year, okay? So each time something changed, in order to get the entire design to catch up, it was about one year. So right now, the, the uh, model-based system engineering tools, the database system engineering tools are much, much better. And what we'll do is as we develop data, it populates throughout the entire system. So if I'm an aerodynamicist and I say my back plane temperature can't be any higher than 350 degrees, then the, the external structures guy says, I can't give you that. I can give you 375 and five uses. If you want 350, I got one use for you and that doesn't match the business case. But that, that communication happens, I'll say somewhat instantly because everyone can see the program and the parts of the program that affect them when something changes over here, they see it over there. And I go, nay, nay, my friend, I will not accept 450 as the top number. You must find a material that can take you know, a lower temperature and, and still survive. So these tools are gonna to be extraordinarily valuable to us. And that's what we're doing. We're just starting to build that tool set today for the model-based or database, data-driven system engineering processes. And, and it has to be from the very beginning to the very end of the process. Hi, hello, uh, very nice to meet you. Uh, I just wanted to ask you um, a question about uh, when you were presenting the, the timeline and the rockets uh, throughout uh, history. Uh, there is something that we can see, a characteristic that is uh, more and more rockets are being produced by private companies and not so much for nations and, uh, and countries. And I wanted to ask you, what are your thoughts on this privatization of the space industry, if you think this is something that is inevitable, or if it's just an extra help in the growth of this industry? Privatization of, of space is going to absolutely accelerate what we do. Um, there were many in the governments that, that launched things that believed that we, the government, were the only ones that could do it. Well, originally, the government was the only ones that could fund it. In Europe, it took a collection of nations to get together to fund the work uh, that ESA performs. Uh, NASA you know, has had a pretty large budget historically, and so the United States could do a lot of that work. You're seeing more collaborative work being done across the globe. This International Space Station, you have uh, European Space Agency, NASA, Canadian Space Agency, uh, 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 JAXA, or Japan, and, um, and even Russian Space Agency is collaborating on that vehicle. So you're gonna see more collaboration but it's the commercial enterprise that will force costs down and efficiency up. Uh, there were a lot of folks that didn't think SpaceX was gonna make it. They said, oh, we're not gonna buy a rocket from SpaceX. SpaceX sued the Air Force for the opportunity to launch Air Force satellites. And SpaceX proved that they were capable of launching them and now they're flying as routinely as the, the um, National uh, Security Space Fleet, which is the Atlas V and the Delta IV. So commercial creates, commercial can take higher risk than governments are, are comfortable with. They don't have to sit in front of a, a group of funding uh, politicians who worry about, can I get reelected? If this thing blows up when I'm in charge, will that, you know, will my career end? They don't have to worry about that. The stakeholders of the company will take care of that for them. And the stakeholders are willing to take more risks today than they've ever been before because they recognize that scientifically we're stronger today and the probability of getting to the end is higher. So I think that that is going to be as important as any parts of the equation I put up there because you have to have the will to do it and the will comes often politically or it comes commercially, and the will commercially is higher. So it's an excellent question. By the way, thank you very much, everybody. It was great to have the opportunity to talk to you.